everybody! Welcome to this week's Power Up. I'm Trisha Hirschberger, joined by the lovely and effervescent Maude Garrett. I'd We've got a really cool show today. We're gonna get chatty. We're gonna get real chatty. Yeah, I had to make sure I was leaning to the right side because I always mess it up and I was gonna be like, the lovely and effervescent, nope! Over here. I didn't. I'm glad I, did. I didn't do that. How are you today, Maude? Um, it's technically my Friday, so I am feeling good. Where's my drink? Maybe I'll grab a drink in a little bit. I'm super <laughs> excited about playing, watching, and reading. We've got uh, Amy Cassandra Martinez on today to also talk about playing, watching, reading, which is a really big thing because she's now playing and reading. Yes! <laughs> she's like two out of the three more than she used to. So this is like really, really cool to explore new parts of the world together. <laughs> Uh, so many familiar names in the chat, which is really, really cool. Oh, thank you, Nathan, for liking my new set, because mm, yeah. that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, that's very you, kind of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and as just a reminder for folks that Power Up, because it's ported into a podcast, and then later you can view it on the Geek Bomb YouTube channel, I do have notifications just minimized and muted, but I will, of course, be thanking you after the show is over, so keep that in mind. I see lots of stuff coming in, and you're going to get all your love at the end of the show. So thank you guys so very much for being here. Right. And uh, as as Maud said, we're going to bring in Amy Cassandra Martinez so that we can talk power, playing, watching, and reading. Let's bring in Amy. Oh, look at what we're all playing. Hey, Amy, how are you? Good. How are y'all? Good. We both got, like... um. Hoops going today. Oh man, uh -huh. you both are so much yeah, fancier than me. Hold on, hold on. You guys got hoops? Yeah. What's I this? don't know if you can see these. Oh my god, it's a space <laughs> crater. That is sick. That's really, really cool. You guys are so fancy and I love it. But this is what Power Up is about, is everybody's different tastes, everybody's different recommendations, so that if you, like many, are stuck at home and you're wondering what should I be playing, watching, or reading next, we got you covered. Um, so, Ma, do you want to kick us off with playing? What are you playing? I need help. I need help. This has actually really been um, bumming my week out. So when we had Emma Fife on, she was talking and really sold to me Persona 5. I loved the description of the game. I thought it would be so perfect for me because I loved Fire Emblem Three Houses. I played I played that through twice on the Switch. I think JRPGs are so much fun. I am hating Persona 5. I hate <laughs> this game. Why? I hate it so much. It's becoming frustrating. It feels like an anxiety attack. Um, so you know Scott Pilgrim, and I just watched the movie recently again, yeah. and I absolutely love it. But that zing what prank zing what, lit, comic book kind of feel. Imagine that on crack, yeah. but so overwhelming that it actually starts and stops gameplay and any kind of fluidity in the storytelling. It just feels like you're convulsing. I'm so sorry you're not loving it. I see Ollie Morrison in chat says Persona is an acquired taste. Um, <laughs> so you know it's. There's some things that are for some people, like Emma Fife, and some things not for people, like you, Mod. But I think it's great that you're letting everyone know what you don't like about it, so that if people like you were moved by what Emma recommended, maybe they'll think bucks. twice about spending money after hearing your recommendation. I played it for two and a half hours. It didn't get better, and then I started looking up if I could refund the game, which you cannot do. As soon as you've downloaded the game, you own the game. What did you and buy so, it on? PlayStation. Hmm. And I, do, I don't want it. I don't want to keep playing this game. Um, I Yeah, Zraken, Scott Pilgrim is an amazing movie. And I yeah, just, just rewatched it again. So I was like in that zone and I was ready for it. But as you can see in that tiny little window part there, um, it's got like different uh, sized and style of font. Um, it tries to do a comic book thing, but it will like, when two characters are on the screen, it'll do like an insert during the conversation of like just their eye and then it'll pop in and out. And then like when you're walking down a corridor, it'll stop to like a cut, not even a cut scene, but like it'll take you somewhere. The whole thing has absolutely zero flow. So you can't get into it. And I was like, the and the, the, the cut scenes that do exist last for so long that I forget that I'm playing a game and I would almost just rather watch Persona then play it. Okay. If it was a game, I'd rather just be playing it. There's no immersion aspect. 
Okay. Well, this kind of, this reminds me of us talking about, you know, reading the dialogue and waiting for that and it feels like our worst nightmare, Ma, to, to have to be forced to just kind of sit there and wait for that to happen. And they when you're just playing a game. Like, the voice actors, they don't talk. They just yell. So they're uh, yelling, what do you mean you don't know where to go next? Okay, this sounds incredibly anime to me. I like anime. I'm good with anime. I love Dragon Ball Z where all they do is scream for 19 minutes every single episode. Like, that's fine. But this is like an oral assault of like the voice acting with a visual assault of the different types of like zigzag zangs and and then like a progress assault because you don't you can't move through it it's so hard to even explore and also like one of the first things you have to do is the map doesn't give you a direction of where to go or like the icon of where you need to be and no. you have to go in like shinju or somewhere in um I'm, I'm guessing japan you have to get on a subway to get to school and it's just it's like being in a real world where I'm, I'm obviously a foreigner and I don't understand uh, any of the symbols or what anything means, but you had to get the J train and then you had to switch over to a different line, but you had to make it to school on time. Guys, that was not fun. So it was stressful. Have you gotten to the yeah. dating sim part yet? No, and I just really want to get there because I was like, that will be my only savior <laughs> of this game. I hear fantastic things about it. So I don't know, maybe if you hang into the dating sim part, but on the other hand, Time is too short. There's a lot of games to play. So if you're not feeling it, just move on to a game that you feel like you would enjoy more. That's a thing, Trisha. I'm also still playing Witcher 3 again. Like, I would have put, I would have hit 300 hours on this game by now. So I'm trying to get out of my comfort zone. I'm mm -hmm. trying to get out of playing the same things over and over and over again. And I thought that, I thought Persona 5 would be fun. And she sold it to me so well. I was like, yes, I love that. Yes, that sounds great. And then, yeah. It's so busy. It's 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 basically like they were going, here is a test to see if you have epilepsy. Go. Oh, <laughs> no. uh, Amy, have I, you played per, the Persona games at all? Have you played Persona 5 Royal? No, but I don't think it sounds like something I would like. Okay. But I wonder, Maude, like if you want, I don't know, like a dating sim, is that what you wanted? Not like I would know, but like... I like I like JRPGs. I liked that fantasy-esque es exploration. I really liked the fact that you were going between sort of real world and then this fantasy-esque sort of like persona. I liked that everyone had like this bigger entity within them. All of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I just wish they cut the stylistic approach down 75%. I want font that I can read. I want a screen that I have the majority, you know, that I can see instead of it just being, you know, obliterated and popping up and aggravating and i also want to be able to play through moments without turning a corner and then being zipped into something else and like oh another cutscene for five minutes and i just want to be able to fucking play i get that i have not played it myself so i can't give any commentary but like i said it's always nice to have the other side of the coin especially when emma was so complimentary talking about this game for so for those of you who listen to or watch that episode you now have another opinion on Persona I, 5 Royal. Does anyone in the chat play Persona 5 or have you played it? And how can I, um, can, you, can, can you sell me it on a little bit better or remind me of how it be good? Yes, Amy. let us know. Okay, while chat's thinking about that, Amy, what you playing? Okay, so the, I'm sorry. E.T. is like right in my lab right now. Okay, um, <laughs> I talked about playing Marvel's Avengers um, mm -hmm. on the Xbox a couple of weeks ago. And I was so pumped about it. It was so much fun. I was loving playing as Hulk. Uh, it was really like a stress reliever. Um, and then I just kind of dropped it for a while. And I was like, I think I'm done. And I was like, Amy, you have to finish the campaign. So I finished the campaign ah, today, actually. Congratulations. Um, Thank you so much. It was rewarding that I finished, but I was at the end of it, I was like, I'm done. I don't, I, with games, I'm finding that every week or so, I'm like, cool, that was fun. Let me do something else. And it was the same thing with Orza. It was the same thing before that. Oh, I played Ori for a bit, right? Ori, Ori. and the Will of the Wind. 
but then I got stuck. And, and usually it's, it sounds like to me, um, if I'm going to play therapist with myself, <laughs> is that I can only handle a video game for a week and I, a week and a half which is great because then I'm sharing it with you guys. So I do want to ask the chat. I want to ask people watching afterward. I have no idea what I'm going to play after this. Like I liked playing Avengers, but I was so done by the end of it. And I was like, please, so, I do like fighting. I was wondering if you might enjoy episodic games where you can finish each episode and story arc in about three hours. And then when you're ready to play the next chapter or the next episode, you have about three hours. And the whole thing put together tells one big story, but you can you can finish it in little chunks. Yeah. Yeah. And I do, I feel like, so I love card games. I love whatever Avengers was. And I like, um, I guess, you, side scrollers. You want recommend it. Honestly, if that's the case, I think you might like Rocket League. Ugh. Oh, no. no! I've seen it be played. And no. It's a bit of a sloppy game, though. It's uh, a what? No offense sloppy. to people that love Rocket League that Amy and I just both made PU <laughs> face when you suggested that. Not I, no, I personally it. am not very good at Rocket League, so just jumping in with people I don't know to get my butt owned over and over isn't fun to me. Um, but I mean, those kind of multiplayer matches would be another short term solution. I'm surprised, Amy, that you gave up on Ori because what I was going to suggest is indie games that you can complete within like the six hour to 20 hour mark because then you can get that complete game hopefully before you get sick of it. But even with Ori, which is a shorter game in general, you still were like, I'm petered out. Well, I got stuck and I didn't know how to get out and I was like, cool, I'll come back to it. And then I did. And then I couldn't get out of it. And I was like, Ori, we're supposed to be in this together. And I was just stuck. And I love the music. I love the way it looked. It was very mm -hmm. therapeutic, like early afternoon kind of vibes, you know, and nothing. And I, I just wanted to get past that point and I couldn't. So I think I might have tried to look up else. You, you might have to look up a walkthrough or watch a streamer or somebody's playthrough video just to get past that point. There's you, no shame in that. Yeah. I mean, there's kind no, of shame know. in that. <laughs> oh, well. It's I mean, not like something But kind else. of. Like, you know, you're like, okay, I can't get past this part. I'm cheating. It's like in an escape room where they say you get three hints. I'm the whoa, person whoa, that's whoa. like, no hints. Whoa. No hints. Whoa. Whoa. This is... Looking up a walkthrough is cheating? Is this is there some sort of parallel between being a gamer and not being able to ask for help? No, I mean, that's the way the you game works is you're supposed to solve the puzzle. It's like if you do the crossword puzzle in your newspaper and look at the answers because you get stuck. Technically, that's cheating, but that's okay. <laughs> it's completing, not cheating. Okay, difference in little, gameplay style a, for sure. Yeah. For me, it's like if I'm no longer having fun and it is affecting sort of like my downtime, which is supposed to be a good time, <laughs> and if one thing happening, I'm not going to be like, all right, me and this problem, we're going to battle it out and it's going to impact me negatively and I'm going to get frustrated. No, get rid of the problem, keep cruising through. I agree with you, but you just have to know that when you get rid of the problem, you are looking up the answer. Look, when it comes to no video games, I take yeah. whatever help I can get. I need help. Right. But I, if I if I can't like <laughs> if I can't find the walkthrough, and that's another issue because I don't even well I obviously have to go back to it because it's been like a maybe two months now. If I can't find the walkthrough and they make that difficult, I am I'm out oh, of there. You'll be you'll be able to that. find a walkthrough. I'm trying to think what game it was recently that I had to actual I had to look something up and I, I of course felt because it's not the type of gamer that I usually am I felt shame but I will <laughs> say there's no shame in it if that's what you need to do to enjoy the rest of the game do it I do still consider it cheating the puzzle you're looking up the solution to the puzzle but that's okay I'm not going to judge anybody else for doing that if that's how you want to play the game I just prefer for myself to not do that at, like I will exhaust all other options first I want to say the, the game was Aurea, but I think it was the second Ori, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. I got stuck yeah. at a part. Is that what you're playing? I got yes. stuck at a part 
in the, I was in the section that's all dark. Is that the section that you're in? I got stuck at a part in the section where it's all dark and I had to look up a walkthrough. I am trying to find out how to make a poll in the chat. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Team Maud or Team Trish when Don't it comes make it to Team Maud or Team Trish. Make it the answers to the question. What, you think that by soliciting a poll that's cheating? Because I think it's no, fun. No, <laughs> I, think, I think making it Team Maud or Team Trish versus it's cheating to look at the solution or it's not cheating to look at the solution. It's not cheating, Team Maud. Uh, I love disagreeing about these particular things. I think it's very, very funny because Trisha and I really are wired in a very, very different way when it comes to playing games. She yes. is very much a rules are there for a reason and you have to do it the correct way. And I am a rules are stickler. It's true. And puzzles are about that. And I'm like, rules only mean something if you acknowledge them. It's because I love games and I love the way that games are designed and I feel like when I go around the way that the game devs intended it to be played. Oh my God, you are so thinking and I'm feeling because you're like, I, I want to think my way through this. Oh yeah, like, I was good playing it. Yeah, wow, that's so interesting. Are you an ET? That, you know what, we'll talk about that in reading. This or so or in Power Down, but yes, I am, I am as J as J can be. You're an ET something. Are you an S or an N? No, we'll talk about it in reading. Know, we'll talk about it. Um, it's looking at a walkthrough. Cheating. Yes. And now, see, my answer would be yes, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, we'll just say yes or no for simplicity's sake. I'm starting the poll now. We'll say yes or no for simplicity's sake. Wow. But my answer is yes, it is cheating, but that's okay. Like if I have a really hard newspaper crossword puzzle or something that I can't solve, Sometimes you got to cheat to finish the whole thing. It's still cheating, but it enabled me to finish the whole thing, which is okay. It's, if I someone think gives you a hint, it. if it's a hint for the answer, so you're not actually looking at the answer, it's like in between. I'm in the middle. That's I true. I would, I would agree with that about the hint. Yeah. It's, it's the end game. It's like, did you complete it? Did you finish it? doesn't matter how you did it, as long as you did it. It's the journey, not the destination. It's this is actually really quite interesting. But um, yeah, we're learning a lot. Uh, Amy needs recommendations for her next game. Uh, mm -hmm. I play video games very differently to Amy, where uh, mm -hmm. where I want to play a game for eighty hours, and once I make that commitment, it's a very um, compatible relationship where we give generously to each other. Um, whereas you're just like, I'm bored next, <laughs> which is super interesting. And there's a lot of good games yeah. for that, but I'm just like, yeah, I get it. Where if I don't like it, I'm not going to like force my way through it. Like persona. It's like, I'm not digging it next. Yep. Uh, so we are almost at the end of the poll. I feel like I can call it now because it's so clear. Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, you know what? It's starting to move the other direction. I'll hold on for a hot second. I can't. I can't see the poll. I'm opening up another window, so excuse some noise that may occur because it's gonna be I finished. Can't. It's gonna be finished in like ten seconds. But oh. I agree. I think you know, honestly, I think that we're all kind of saying the same thing. That everyone is on board with, like, if you have to look up a walkthrough, by all means, look up a walkthrough. If you're doing a Sudoku and or I always say it wrong. So Sudoku. 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 Thank you. If you're doing a Sudoku and you have to look up one of the numbers to finish the rest of it, I, I would still say you cheated a little, but you finished it. Good job. Yeah, well, I mean, Sudo I love Sudoku. <laughs> but yeah. I feel like that's a that's a clear, you know? And with Ori, you're like, I don't know where to go. I had a Sudoku book and I would take it on pl planes with me. I, that's God. the only time I've ever played is on planes. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so here we go. Uh, it is a clear winner that the chat sides with Maud on this one. Is looking at a walkthrough cheating? 61% of the chat says no. 39% of the chat says yes. My full answer, rather than the binary yes or no, would be yes, it's cheating, but that's okay. But we all have different opinions, and the audience has sided with Maud which is fine. You can all cheat at your puzzle games and I won't tell anybody. 
I think what we're taking away from this is it's like the goal is to be having fun. 100%. Yeah. At whatever cost. <laughs> Including walkthroughs. That's scary. I've, I've walked yeah. through. Well, guys, if we, we'll do confessions after this. The games that I have walked through. <laughs> I, I have completely walked through a Switch game in the last 12 months. The whole game. But that's okay if you enjoyed it. That's what I'm like. Uh, yes, it's cheating, but cheating's fine. I I had a really good time being told how to play the game because it was about... <laughs> And uh, chat actually brings up a good point. Who said it? Earth Intruder said Ori can also on occasion introduce new mechanics and not give you the info you need to know how to use it, which was a problem for a lot of old school NES games, I remember, um, where it was like a tran more of a like language translation issue that it just made no sense. Like in Castlevania 2, how were you supposed to know that you had to go to the wall all the way at the edge of the one map and just kneel there for 10 seconds and then a tornado would come and take you to another part of the land? Like, would that never. is in no way told to you never. at any point. Ev pretty much everyone I know had to call Nintendo Power to get the answer of how to do that. Yeah, no. Was it, there was no, like, picture frame, like, with a hint? No, no, no. That's no, then no, no. Mm -hmm. But that's what happened back in those days. Like, devs would even, not for, like, main play but like devs would hide uh like little designer rooms in there and like it was only if you did exactly kind of that the most random things that you would discover the little secret easter eggs that's how easter eggs first came about yep i think it also depends what type of games you play i play a lot of puzzle games so looking up the solution in a puzzle game does a hundred percent feel like cheating <laughs> I... versus if you're looking up like I don't know if you're looking up a walkthrough to find a try to find a hidden level in a game that's an action RPG or something like that. That's not necessarily looking up the solution to the game. I'm gonna read out this comment from Ace of Jacks, uh, who said, "If using a walkthrough is cheating, then you can't Google Maps to get anywhere anymore because that would be cheating." Except for you're not born with a tutorial and a game developer telling you how to play a game. So I mean, Google Maps is a tutorial. I mean, if we're having a debate, a very healthy discourse here. I mean, I think, I think saying, on. and this is the last I'll say on it now, and then we'll save it for Power Down, because otherwise we're just going to talk about this for an hour. Using Google Maps in real life is like using the map that a game dev gives you in a game with a map. So not using Google Maps in real life is like not using the map in Breath of the Wild. That's a more accurate comparison than to saying looking up a walkthrough. Oh, that was a good rebuttal. That was yep. a good rebuttal. There you Throw go. You Girl, got it. it. You cool. got it. But uh, anyway, the games that I've been playing lately, so it's funny because it shows Ori on the graphic here, not specifically Ori. And uh, for those of you who have been watching my streams all week, you're probably like, okay, Trish, we get it. Um, but I'm super excited because I uh, did a partnership with Verizon to get the Galaxy Note 20 and the 5G enabled one, which means that you can actually game on it and it's good and it's fast. And I've been playing around with Game Pass games, cloud streaming through the phone. So everything that's available on Game Pass, let me see if I can just kind of yeah, show yeah. you. Here's here's just a little sample, A Plague Tale Innocence, After Party, um, but major games, Halo's on here, Shadow of War's on here, um, Indies and AAAs alike, everything that's on the Game Pass library that you can cloud stream through your phone. So I've been messing around a lot with that lately and just kind of seeing what the power of the device is, what I can do with it. In your picture, you um, it shows like a little controller that snaps on the side of the phone. I don't have that. I've just been pairing an Xbox One controller via Bluetooth. That was my next question. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Yeah, I've been using an Xbox One controller via Bluetooth, and then it's different for each type of Android phone, but at least for Samsung, they have something called Samsung Dex, where you can wirelessly cast your screen to the television. So uh, this can be your console. Granted, in places where you have that fast of a connection, but this can be your console working through the phone and then just casting to a TV wirelessly and Bluetoothing to your controller wirelessly. So for someone that's a little bit of a gadget junkie like me, this is really fascinating to mess around with. Like I have a Game Pass Ultimate subscription so I can play all these games on my PC, 
but having them available to play on the go, again, if you live in an area that has 5G coverage, I mean, Game Pass games like The Witcher on the go. You're going to need to slow down for me. If I have an Xbox account, Microsoft, because of all that, I can access my Xbox account on my PC and play all my games through my PC. If you have Game Pass or Game Pass Ultimate. I have Game Pass. There you go. Then if you have an Android phone. I don't have an Android phone. Well, but I have a PC set up to stream <laughs> games that I didn't know how to connect my Xbox to, but I guess now I can. Uh, if you have an Android phone, it is not available on iPhone. Apple I have has... an Android phone. Oh, okay, great. Yes, if you have an Android phone, um, then you can do, you can pair up with Game Pass, download the Game Pass app and mess around with it for yourself and see what you think. Samsung has a partnership with Microsoft where you can also then like get skins and DLC and purchase that through the Game Pass app. Um, but yeah, app. download the Game Pass app and mess around with it and see what you think. Oh, snap. Right? Whole- That's what I've been messing around with a lot lately. So a lot of them are games I've already played, but now I'm experimenting with playing these games. But if I buy it on Game Pass, I can play it on my PC through my Android. If you, well, okay, if you have Game Pass Ultimate, you can play it on your PC anyway. You don't need to go through your Android. Do I have Game Pass Ultimate? Game Pass is just Xbox, and Game Pass Ultimate is Xbox and PC. No, I don't have Xbox and PC because I never had the PC. I mean, you might have Ultimate anyway. Just check. It's not, check. Whatever, whatever it's nine ninety five nine ninety nine a month or whatever. <laughs> okay, that's, I think that's regular, regular Game Pass. Maybe a... Oh man, that's so cool. Okay. But yeah, okay. mess around with it because I mean, for me, I've never been a fan of classic mobile gaming because I think a lot of the games that are made for phones are like Candy Crush and Temple Run and there's nothing yeah. wrong with those games. They're just not the type of games that I enjoy um, for I the that. most part. Every now and then an exceptional creep in there. Um, however, if you're telling me I can play Ori on my phone on the go or you're telling me I can play Halo on my phone on the go or Shadow of War on my phone on the go. Now I'm listening oh, up. So good. Yeah. Now, right, now you've game. got my attention. <laughs> yeah. This is exciting. This means that I'm going to be because I was really struggling with PC games to uh, stream, but I love my I like my PC, but I love my Xbox. Um, and I actually <laughs> one of the games I was going to recommend for you, Amy, if you like short bursts of attention span. Um, and different ways to customize things so it always feels unique and different. I really liked um, Overwatch. And I think that you could do some fun things on Overwatch, maybe. I also liked Bioshock. I played that for a bit. Bioshock's the original or Bioshock Infinite? Because Infinite's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <sighs> I'm excited for you. I'm excited for me now. And Trish, I guess I'm excited for you because you've been using... The phone. So we've had a good, this is a good playing. This yes, is a good playing. This was a good playing. I think everybody's happy, uh, which is awesome. Um, so, Maud, I am sad that you spent two and a half hours so far in Persona 5. Five. And I did not in enjoy it. I'm okay. sorry. But hopefully, we'll get you on something or just get back to Witcher for the millionth time that you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. That's a good playing. Uh, let us know what you are currently playing as well in that chat. Uh, But let's move things on to watching because power is an acronym playing, watching, and reading. Ladies, what have we been watching the last couple of weeks? Ooh, 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 ooh. Amy, tell us what you've been watching. Okay, well, um, uh, I've seen a bunch of stuff that you ladies also have, so I'll chime in when you talk about those. But the one that you guys haven't seen is Enola Holmes completely. I have. Um, Completely? Not completely. <laughs> I won't spoil the end, but uh, it's really good. So Nola Holmes stars Millie Bobby Brown and Henry Cavill and Sam Claflin. Claf- Claflin. Claflin. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's very, um, if it breaks the fourth wall a lot. Millie Bobby Brown does a great job. It's It's like a young adult kind of take on Sherlock Holmes. And I say that having never seen Sherlock Holmes ever. Um, oh. But I can't, like, I know, I know that's a whole nother Wait, thing. Wait, like any but, rendition of Sherlock Holmes? No, like I might've seen a scene of- uh, The Benedict Cumberbatch yeah. one? 
Yeah, so good. I might have seen a scene of that, but off writing, it's so good. It's so good. Mark Freeman's yeah. amazing in it. It's, it's such a brilliant series. I think it's all done though, huh? I feel like I was waiting for more and it never happened. It is done, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a two-hour movie. It's great. It. I think that they cover a lot of ground. Helena Bonham Carter is in it as well. Did not know that. And it's fun. It's it's nothing that you um, have to know anything about Sherlock Holmes for mm. or about uh, in order to enjoy it. And the pacing's good. No, like I, I really, I liked, I always have an issue with period pieces. Sometimes I can get a little bit like, if they don't suck me in in the first 15 minutes and I'm struggling the rest of the time, but they suck me in um, and it's good. You don't have Do to run to fact? see it, but it is, what? Do you want a fun fact about this one? So my <gasps> croft, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, Mycroft is Sherlock Holmes's older brother, but Sam Claflin, Claflin is four years younger or three years younger than um, Henry Cavill. Yeah. Ah. You can't really tell, honestly. Like, they, they do a good job with the costumes. And there's... Uh, Henry Cavill is so delicious. There's not enough of him in this movie, but I understand it's not called Sherlock Holmes. It's called Matilla. I get he's it. He's so good looking. Like, it's distracting. I, I have mean, no idea what he said. You're not wrong. Said. Have you seen the PC build video? I don't I think love I love that video. <laughs> I'd start weeping. I would start crying. Yeah. yeah. And he knows exactly what he's doing, too. It's very funny. Yeah. He, he does a great job. And I really like how Millie played off of everyone. There's a lot of big names okay. in the UK, I would say, but also a lot of like Harry Potter cameos. Um, and she does a great job. I It's number two on trending when I looked last earlier today on Netflix. And yeah, I think. She's 16 and she's producing. She, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like one of her first things, if not the first one. And it falls under the, I want to say legendary umbrella. So it's like this whole thing. But I was like, wait a second, what? Yeah. I but wonder how job. much well, she's well. actually producing, though, or if it's just like part of her contract to get a producer credit. Got it. Yeah, because she still falls under the child safety laws where she can't film for more than eight hours a day. So how would she be acting on set and producing the movie? Because they're like, they're I long. mean, maybe maybe she is taking on production responsibilities. I have no idea, but I'm just curious. If anyone in chat it's has any insight into that, please let us know. Um, on IMDb, it definitely said that like it falls under the umbrella that like falls under uh, PC something something that she has. So I don't think it's like full on producing because there's a bunch of producers on this. But to have her name and say like producer next to it at 16 is pretty cool. It is pretty so, cool. So, and I yeah. thank you for reminding me, Amy. I had forgotten that it was a movie. I was thinking that it was a series. Um, so the fact that it's a movie makes it so much quicker to consume. Well, I yeah. think they're setting it up to be a franchise. Oh, very yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely on my list of things I want to watch. So thank you for that recommendation. Um, I And I just have to throw out, because I just saw it, it's a highlighted message in chat. Chris Pallet says, Rick Moranis is hot. I only say that because when I was in the army, people used to say I looked like him. I've been drinking, by the way. And I will tell you, as someone who has not been drinking, I concur. Rick Moranis is hot and was one of my first crushes. Yep, true story. I know. I see Mod's, Mod's face. Mod and Amy both. Okay, that's all right. You don't have to agree with me. Ourselves. <laughs> I love, I love me a smart that's man. I'm all about it. Yeah, sapiosexual. You know, you're attracted to intelligence. I'm attracted to a butt chin. Um, <laughs> Amy, what have you been watching? I just told you. Yeah. Oh, that's Sorry, Trish. Trish. <laughs> <laughs> you were so you were so taken aback by the fact that I said that I find Rick Moranis attractive that you didn't know where to go from there, and that's okay. Um, so I have been oh, watching. I Thing. Rick Moranis was obviously quite short. And that's just like... Oh, that doesn't do it for you. I'm hobbit-sized. Everybody's taller than me. The, blame the patriarchy for that one. Sorry, soz guys. You created that and you suffer for it. So, hmm. I'm totally, I'm totally okay with it as a hobbit. Um, so I was watching, speaking of trending on Netflix, 
Um, I saw Ratchet trending number one on Netflix, and silly me was like, oh, I have no idea what this is about, but it's number <gasps> no. one right now, so let's check it out. So my husband and I sit down to watch Ratchet, not knowing what we're in for. I know, Amy, your face is 100% appropriate right now, not knowing what we're in for. And like, you know, the first episode is like really Hitchcockian and like the DP and the lighting person are like totally making all these mood shifts happen. It's very dramatic. Oh. It's very artsy. It's very cool. Uh, very and Ryan Murphy. Very and Ryan, it is a Ryan down. Murphy. Yes. And which yeah. I guess some people love or hate. Um, but I, I thought that, I thought those aspects of it were really interesting. There were some shots that were really unsettling, but I thought they were meant to be unsettling. Like just from that perspective, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, I got two episodes in and I will tell you by the end of episode two, I was like, I can't watch this anymore. I can't watch it anymore. I need to tap out um, because it's so disturbing. So then, of course, I went down the internet rabbit hole to learn that this is a precursor to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and tells us about how Nurse Mildred Ratchet came to become the Nurse Ratchet we see in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, and one of the greatest cinematic villains of all time. Who mama. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know that I would say necessarily that I recommend this to people. I would say if you like, if you really like dark and disturbing movie stuff and you like that kind of like super mood setting, DP lighting, Ryan Murphy, kind of like I said to me, kind of Hitchcockian. Like if you like that stuff, give it a shot. Maud's pointing at Amy right now. But Amy, you were still like, Ugh. so have you had thoughts on this? Have you tried it? Yeah, so I watched the first episode. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to, but it is, yeah, like you said, number one on trending. And um, it is stunning, like you said. I wanted to switch it up. I don't know what took over me, but I did something that I've never done before while watching. And I, I wouldn't do this for a movie because I think it's a lot of work. But I took Italian in college, and I've been doing Duolingo here and there um, for Italian. So right before Sarah Paulson comes onto the screen, I think it's like 10 minutes into the first episode, I switched the language to Italian with English subtitles just for fun. I was like, you know what? This is a crazy show. Let's kick it up a notch. Sure. So I did, and it was, it was fun. It was actually really fun because, I mean, yes, I like Sarah Paulson. I kind of like Ryan Murphy stuff, like, meh. Uh, and I loved how it looked, but I was a little bit like weirded out by some of the acting and just the pacing of it and what Nurse Ratched was doing. Um, but I was like, okay. But to have that other layer of the language thing, it made it more enjoyable. But I did finish the first episode and I don't know if I'm going to continue watching it. Like, I love me good horror, gore, decapitations, all that good stuff. Um, but something was missing and I don't know what it was. Okay. I I don't know. I might give it a shot, especially since you said that at the end of episode episode two, you were like, time out, no more. Now I'm like, well, what happens in episode two? Yeah, I'm not going to tell any. I'm not going to tell because I don't want to spoil it. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone who goes into it not knowing anything, which mm -hmm. I think honestly was really good for my viewing experience that my husband and I didn't know where this was going. So all of the stuff that I've said today doesn't spoil any of the stuff that I'm talking about. Um, yeah, we didn't know what was happening. We were just like, and so Sarah Paulson, for those of you in chat asking if you're watching this in video format, you can see a picture of her in the, what is that, our lower left hand corner there. Um, and so Nate and I were just trying to guess like, the whole time like what is her game what is she up to you know and trying to figure it out and I think we're really enjoying the kind of mystery aspect of it all um and then when it took a specific turn at the end of episode two we were like oh I think I know where this is going now and I think I'm no. not on board are there eye needles are there eye needles I'm not saying a thing is it a lobotomy I'm not saying anything but if I mean, you I'll watch, watch you will know. Um, so I'm, yeah, I can't necessarily say that I recommend that one. But the other one that I that I just watched today, actually, that I can recommend, dun 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 dun, is and I have a show and tell for it. 
Console Wars! Console Wars. Console Wars. So you see a picture of it there if you're watching this in video format. But I do want to show you because uh, CBS All Access. So this just came out on CBS All Access yesterday. And at South by Southwest 2020, it won a bunch of awards. Oh, man. It's actually executive produced by Seth Rogen. Is it really? Pretty- yeah. Seth Rogen's a part of this. And it's the first... Uh, like docu series that has been greenlit by CBS All Access, um, and I was like, "Why Seth Rogen with video games?" I was like, "Oh yeah, he kind of." <laughs> so the thing that I liked about it is like, yes, we've seen a lot of video game documentaries come out recently, um, but I this saw- one specifically focuses on Sega and kind of the rise and fall of Sega and how there weren't even it's called console wars because there weren't like this idea we have of the console wars and which consoles winning out wasn't a thing then because Atari was displaced by Nintendo and it was just all Nintendo reigning until Sega came on the scene. And so it highlights their journey. And oh my gosh, some of this is some 80s stuff in here. There's a slinky. Hmm. Sega versus Nintendo. There's a slinky. There's some Kool-Aid packets. That's hilarious. What? Some socks. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in here. But anyway, I just watched this today just because it's good for me to know because I like video games and I was interested in it anyway. And like I said, the more I can educate myself on video game history, I think the better I can speak to things. Like when people ask on gender and gaming to be able to say, well, this is what was happening in the 90s. This is what was happening in the 80s with the way games were marketed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I like to know that. Dunkaroos! You should watch Man, it just for the so, Dunkaroos. I thought that they were Australian only because it was a kangaroo. Oh, Dunkaroos are awesome. But yeah, so anyway, I got a bunch of fun stuff for this. Um, I checked it out today. I really enjoyed it. It's about 90 minutes long, the documentary. Um, So again, it's a nice little easily digestible thing if you want to check it out. But I enjoyed it a lot. I remember we had an issue about this last week where we say S-E-G-A differently. Oh, yeah, because we say Sega. Yeah, and I know, like, even like, the ads were like, Sega. Yeah. And it, it's Sega. <laughs> I was going to say, the Sega yell is uh, is very clearly, Sega. Sega. Yeah, no, Sega in Australia. Well, that's And Rydian agrees, and he's Welsh, <laughs> so I think it's a transatlantic kind of Sega. Yeah, Sega. <laughs> There's some people shouting out Sega in chat. I see it. I see it. Maud, yeah. what have you been watching? Oh, I watched another kind of horror. Um, I watched The Social Dilemma. It's a really, really well put together documentary that explores basically 2010 to 2020, more so like 2007, I guess, 2017, but just how social media has impacted our lives in a profound way. And there's a few kind of uh, tidbits from this that have really sat with me and like scared me. Uh, And the first one was um, software and all about things on social media. It's called, um, I think it's the clients of that are called users. Mm -hmm. So we are users of social media. We are users of software. And that is how we are described. The only other industry or avenue in which people that use a product are called users is illegal drugs. And it's this parallel that if you are a user of something, you are addicted. It is a funnel force. And what these big companies do is try to keep you looking at your phone for as long as humanly possible, because that is how they earn and make money. And that is like all of the sound effects, all of the vibrations, all of like the placement, none of it are accidents. Like they are all done purposely to keep you locked in the phone. Something that I found fascinating about Facebook is when they created the like button, They honestly and honest to God created it to want to spread positivity. So if you're putting something out there, it's like, yay. But then that ended up becoming its own beast, which was like, well, how many likes did you get? And it became a form of validation. The byproduct of the like button has now translated to mental health issues, mainly for girls more than guys, but the increase in tween girls Uh, that self-harm 
mm-hmm. has increased exponentially, like 167% in a five, a five or a 10 year gap. And that is purely indicative of social media use. And teen suicide has gone up. Like it is this, and then it goes like that. It spikes because of the introduction of social media. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it uses almost storytelling narrative in an overarching thing, which is about uh, this teenage boy who has a phone and like trying not to be addicted to it, uh, mm-hmm. but how it impacts his life. And then also kind of like personifies social media companies trying to lure the user into their product. But essentially like this is all about money. It like just comes down to advertising and marketing and trying to make as much money as possible. And this one guy who was working at Google realized the negative implication of the company. And he wrote this, uh, made this amazing presentation explaining that being addicted to social media is not great and shouldn't be the end goal and sent it to like a hundred of his nearest and dearest in Silicon Valley that he trusted with this and didn't hear back from one of them. So he quit and he started his own company that is all about ethical use of social media. And what's so interesting is that social media started off so that they provided a platform and we as the public created content for it. But now they create the platform and we then have to pay or we have to uh, not only create the content, but have to abide their rules and pay money to get more people sort of looking at it. So they are controlling every single facet of social media now. We're making content for them and we're giving them our money. And in no other way should we be doing both of those things. Yeah, it's incredibly frustrating from the content creator standpoint in that respect. It's incredibly frustrating when you talk about it from a mental health standpoint. Um, But one of the things, because I start, I've not finished the series, but I started it. Um, And one of the things that really struck me was about how quickly fake information spreads on social media. And six about times how faster. six times faster than true information, and about how all of the various algorithms and uh, big names in tech kind of looked the other way because they were like, "Well, it's going viral. Well, it's getting shared. It's keeping people on the platform. It's doing better numbers for us." And um, it was terrifying to me to see how quickly the false media spreads faster than the real media, and how your search results. Um, will vary based on where you live and other type of things that you've looked up. And for that reason alone, I feel like everyone in the United States needs to watch this. Just to understand that if you are Google searching and you type in coronavirus and the first five things that come up are, is a hoax, is that real, fake news, etc. That could be 100% because of where you live or because of something you've looked at before. So So they do in the show, they call it like the puppet strings of like people Mm -hmm. are being puppeted and aren't even aware they're being puppeted. Um, And that to me was a, yes, like you said, terrifying, like it's a horror film, um, but also just so important for people to know. Yeah. When we look up information, we are being fed only a portion and a type of skewed information and some of it most of it isn't even necessarily true um so we are becoming encased in our own individual echo chamber Mm -hmm. so timelines feeds everything we are inundated with is kind of echoing our own sentiments and we are not getting like a crossfire or a, a, a corroborating view on things. And when we go to our news sources, I mean, I come from a much smaller country where we have about 25 or 26 million people and we didn't have biased news. You presented the news as factual because it was, and it wasn't until I moved to America that it was like, oh, there's two different types of facts. And I'm being presented mm-hmm. two very contrasting pieces of evidence. And I was but like, But you're Whoa. only being presented both because you're seeking both out. Most people are only presented one. And they don't look for the other one. And I, so the I, I, more I, yeah. and the right are becoming more right. Mm-hmm. And another show that's coming out, which actually explores how Russia um, infiltrated the 2016 election by creating troll farms. And all that did was try to, it, they, they didn't want Trump to win. They just knew that they could do the most damage to America as a country if he was in power. So all they did was push 
the left to become more left and the right to become more right. And they created this rift because when we are broken, that's when we are vulnerable. And so that was all Russia's doing, using social media against America to cause a rift. And I've only been in this country for seven years and I've, I'm able to tell that the left are becoming more left and the right are becoming more right at a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. Like there's no fence sitting anymore. The notion of being a moderate almost doesn't exist. And good luck trying to have a civil conversation or any kind of discourse because we're so set in this belief now and that is becoming concrete. And this is why I think we're coming, we're, we're charging towards a civil war. Well, I hope that that's not the case. Uh, and we've all had many conversations about that before. But at least educating yourself about what social media's role, what social media's role is in well, that greater landscape, I think is really important. The number one reason why it happened, like social media has impacted us in such a profound, dangerous, and like it's, it's, what social media has managed to do in the last 10 years is extreme. And I would also I mean, a lot of cyber cyber laws and cyber rules and anything that involves sort of the, the internet, we aren't catching up quick enough. The laws and like the judicial system and anything like we're literally eating the, the internet's dust at this stage. It's, it's just would, moving too fast. I would also add uh, like as much as I I think I, I mean, I think people should definitely watch it, like you guys said, but the narrative part of it was the cheesiest thing that they could have done. And I was like, I didn't oh hate my it. God. I didn't hate it. It was so stupid. I hated well, I, it so I hate it. much. Some people learn by infographs, seeing numbers, seeing the charts, and some people need to be told, like through story. So I kind of appreciate yeah. it that they used multiple ways. I I've seen that done so much better. And I think that's why I was like, oh, and at the end, you're like, OK, great. And it feels like it's leading somewhere. Right. So they're going to leave you with like, here's what we're going to do about it or exact steps of how they're changing it on their end. And it was just like, we've got issues. And we yeah. Where and I was like, <laughs> yeah, but where's the okay. heart? Like, what so give us what is it? I mean, if these people are so smart, which they are, and they have the experience, I needed more. Regardless of that, though, um, it opens your eyes to things that most of us don't know because we're not in Silicon Valley. Right. So I think the step after that is for us, since they don't really know it, was <laughs> to double check where you get the information from, which some people already do. But it's like, you only fed this, seek out the other thing and just learn more. Because, yeah, I mean, those were my big gripes with the thing, but everyone's talking about it and everyone should be watching it, even if you're like, well, I don't know, or even if you hate the narrative. Well, I think, I think again, just so that you have the awareness of yeah. what social media's role is playing in the current climate here in the United States and all over the world, I think that's really important to have that knowledge uh, mm -hmm. going into any conversations or elections yeah. or anything you might have coming up. And I think it's so funny because it's like this whole notion of being a sheep. But when you think about it, like we are being so manipulated by social media and we don't even realize. I think that's kind of like a good way to educate yourself through it as well and be on top of it because it's kind of controlling you in very subtle ways. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. Which anyway. makes it feel like a horror series. <laughs> like, yeah. That's your week. Yeah, Who knew we'd be covering so much horror this week? <laughs> I, I actually, this is the reason why I'm on my couch. My other area is set up for horror stuff, ready to go for October. I didn't want to bring it in before then, so. Okay. Well, you, you tease us with that, Amy, and eventually we'll all get to see that surprise. I like your style. Um, so that wraps up watching and what we've all been watching and uh, whether or not you want to take our recommendations, feel to, free to do so at your own risk, um, or let <laughs> us know what you've been watching in the comments or in the chat. Let's take it over to reading. Yeah. Yay. Trish, do you want to start off there? Who, me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so on a completely uh, much more peaceful note, um, I have been reading, because so many oh, yeah. things are such a horror story, I have been reading a book that I often go to, which is more of a picture book than anything else, because a lot of you know I, I don't have a lot of time to sit down and read all in one sitting. But this is Middle Earth, New Zealand 
landscape and location in the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogies. So it's photos of the filming locations in New Zealand that they use to create Middle Earth. And um, a lot of you may know that I honeymooned in New Zealand to see all the uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movie filming locations. So it holds a very special place in my heart. But, I mean, this is, like, what that actually looks like. So this is photography by Ian Brody of just some of the things that you will find there. <sighs> Oh my God, I can hear it. Dun, 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 right? dun. <laughs> and it's just, it's so peaceful and so wow. lovely. Um, and like some of these like locations we actually went to, like this is Hobbiton. <gasps> so pretty. And creating Hobbiton. Um, and so, yeah, when I need a little break from all the realistic things of the world that are getting me down, I can just... Escape. Look at some of these photos. Some are of nature. Some are like this is Hobbiton, fully built as the set. Here, let me. How, how do we get you on a bigger screen so Here. we can see this Good a little call. bit better? Good call. That's better. Yes. Look at that. Tilt down a little. Oh, it's so pretty. Oh my goodness. Oh my god. And just real and lovely and awesome. Um, and yeah, I mean, I remember just talking to uh, native New Zealanders and saying, you know, oh, we want to check out the Lord of the Rings locations. And they're like, oh, have you been to Mount Doom? Have you been to, and, you know, and it's like, ah! it was so cool. So very cool. And, you know, you, you do, you feel like you're living in the beauty that is Middle Earth, except for it's actually New Zealand. And it's stunning and it's peaceful and it's a great escape. So that's that's the book that I would recommend is Middle Earth, so, New Zealand. So you went to the South Island, right? I actually didn't. We only did the North Island because we were only going to be there for seven days. Um, mm. Here in the United States, you only get two weeks off a year from work. So um, unlike all the other honeymooners that we ran into from other places in the world that all had six weeks, we had two. So we were seven days in New Zealand and we thought we just didn't want to spend most of that time traveling. We wanted to spend most of that time doing. So we agreed to keep it to the Northern Island only, um, which is where Hobbiton is. And uh, so we didn't see Weta Workshop in person. On my next return, Weta is going to be very high up on my list. We should all just move to New Zealand and call it a day. Let's be honest. It's so beautiful there. <laughs> uh, Auckland was great. Uh, thank you so much for that one. Mm -hmm. I want to get a little into the comprehensive ENFP survival guide. Now, usually when I tell you what I have been reading, it has a dragon in it. It is the mm -hmm. Assassin series or it's you know, Patrick Rothfuss's series, or it's like all of these big nerd books. I love Dresden Files. And I've realized I really read within one or two genres only. If I'm looking up a bestseller list, I go straight to sci-fi fantasy. Sci-fi and fantasy is my jam. But Amy recently said when reading that she wanted to explore a fiction book and a non-fiction book. And I was just like, non-fiction? What do you think that is? On Audible, when you purchase it, it's kind of like your Game Pass on Xbox. Included in your subscription fee, you get titles include, like included. And so I looked throughout all of the free titles that were available on so many different um, genres that I would never look into. I got Call of, the, uh, Call of Cthulhu. I got like a bunch of cool Frankenstein books. Like I got something in my genre, but then I went out. And one of them that caught my attention was the comprehensive ENFP guide. I smashed this out in like two or three days um, because it is fully informing me on my personality type. Now, whether you give two hoots about personality types and tropes, and there's so many different versions of it or types, this is the Maya Briggs and Maya Briggs, either people absolutely adore it or they call it uh, BS. But um, the breakdown of it is basically I'm more extroverted than introverted. I'm more intuitive than sensing. I'm more think uh, feeling than thinking, Trisha. Uh, and I'm more perceptive than... Oh, judging. Judging. That's it. 
So I've learned all about the kind of person that I am. I um, It also tells you sort of what you're like in a relationship, what you look for, the problems that will arise, how you are in work situations. And it's like some things are really like, well, yeah, duh, I get that totally. Like the fact that I only work in bursts. I can't sit down and do a nine to five job. I can't do the same mundane task day in and day out. I need excitement. I need um, you know, new sensory kind of overloads. I like ideas instead of actually doing them. Um, but there are other things that I've discovered about my personality where I'm like, they, they go through the myths of your personality. And one of them was the ENFP doesn't often have a relationship because they're really picky. And I'm like, well, that's true. And they're like, false. You're not really picky. You just need incredibly deep connection. And if someone can't get on your level with that, you don't care because you don't do surface level bullshit. And the other thing was you also have a tendency that when you have an amazing thing in front of you, you go, what else is there? And so that actually doesn't really accommodate for long-term relationships. And so I was like, oh, that explains so much. And I really like learning and having information and being able to apply it. And so this has ticked off a bunch of different nonfiction books that I've been plowing through. And I'm really, really liking this sort of like exploration of learning because my whole life I was like, I'll figure it out. But now it's like, or I could just have the information be handed to me. So guys, nonfiction for the win. It's like I've turned a new page, so to speak. But I'm wondering if anyone knows their personality type, if they care about it, if they don't at all. Go ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm actually taking a test now, so I will let you know in a second because I forget. I'm calling it. I know that you I'm are... an E in the beginning and a J at the end, but I don't yes. remember the middle one. So I'm gonna I'm taking a quick C now. Amy, do you know? Yeah, ENFJ. Ah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, I know a lot about ENFJs and how we relate together as well. That's so funny. Um, I think you are an E. Let's What's see. the opposite to that? N again. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Someone says they are an ABCD. Well done. There you go. I know chat was really ripping this S. one apart. They're like, this is like your horoscope. It's total baloney. You just have to take it with a grain of salt. You I think you're an with ESTJ. It, but... I think you're an ESTJ. Let's see. Maybe. Who knows? I don't know. This is a long test. <laughs> Doc Lazarus, I'm definitely an LGBT. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Love that. Perfect. Well, I, I yeah, we can, we can get back to what I am. I know I'm in, in, last I took it, I remember being an E in the beginning and a J at the end. And I remember, because Erica Ishii and I talked about this when we co-hosted Game Engine together. And Erica and I were almost the exact opposite on everything except for E. Interesting. Um, which so you could definitely tell in that show because I was the one that was like, let's keep this on the rails. And Erica was like, chaos gremlin. Uh, and so the two of us made a show that was very fun and worked uh, yes. because we kind of complimented each other in that way. But it was funny when we found out we were like almost exactly opposites because we were like, yep, that tracks. Yeah, the I, I, I'm not the structure person and in duos, I often am the tangent one and I have to get roped back in. And like, that's how I form good duos which is why you usually keep us on track. And I'm like, let's talk about this for another 10 minutes. And you're like, uh, no. Well, but it's also why you could make uh, SourceFed Plays D&D or Fungin super successful. And I honestly probably wouldn't have been able to. Because you have to have the rules. And I'm like, all right, the rules are, there are no rules. And right. Like, and what? for me, I'm How like, no rules? <laughs> cool. Then that's not D&D. I'm like, that's a different game. That's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> Yeah, it's why I couldn't have made it work with that group for sure, because I would have wanted to play actual D&D. But yes, as someone in chat just said, that's some source fed energy for sure. Like that balance of like people that keep it on the rails and people that take the chaos everywhere for sure. A hundred percent. That's really funny. Yeah, I think, I mean, the biggest thing about the P and the J um, is that And Amy, you can attest to this because we work at Geek Bomb. I will be like, all right, here's a list. I'll have a burst. And I'm like, right. And I'm like, all this needs to be done. And then throughout the week, all my J's just tick it off and it gets done. And then you won't hear from me for like five days. And then I'm like, oh, another burst. And then it will just, oh, okay. And then it's another checklist and it all gets done. But Amy's really good at that regulatory thing where she's like, hey, it's Tuesday. I need this from you. And I'm like, is it? Tuesday 
oh god okay yeah yeah yeah. and then she's like i also needed all the other things that you said you would do and you haven't done and i'm like well no yeah because like i'm out walking because it's walk time now like i can't <laughs> and so i saw my phone writing the description of functions because i didn't do it i forget things a lot of the time as well anyway that's a really fun discussion amy what are you reading um it's he's like grabbing my hand he wants to say hi um so this book is called mexican gothic and it feels like a work of art just look at it it is stunning it is by sylvia moreno garcia um i actually heard about this um through twitter i want to say it's very it's very um what is it dinner time is that why no he's just like hey let's hang out i'm like dude hold on I've heard really good things about this book, by the way, and I think it's one of our shortlisted and it has been for a while with uh, Book Club, Notice Book Club. I highly recommend. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he can't go up there. There's a shelf, and I don't oh. want to put more weight on it. And so he's like eyeing it. Okay, so, yes, this is very um, – I saw – uh, Crimson Peak, which I'd never seen. It's a gothic horror romance uh, movie by or directed by Guillermo del Toro. It was so good. And this is very in line with that. It's um, she is the main character and her name her name is Noemi and she basically goes she gets this mysterious letter from her cousin and she goes to her cousin. Her cousin's living in this fancy house with her husband and like some of the family members. And it's very sketchy because she's been sent over there to take care of her, like kind of check on her. And um, she leaves Mexico City, which I I love Mexico City so much. So it's very, obviously, very Mexican inspired, very Mexican. Um, and stuff goes down in this house. I want to read you guys just a little short paragraph. And uh, I love that you're going to read to us. It's just a little tiny bit. Um, okay. Uh, see if you recognize something from it. It ties to our plane. Okay. She looked over her shoulder before turning a corner. He seemed a bit ghostly, still standing by the doorway with the glow of the lanterns and candles in his room, lighting his blonde hair like an unearthly flame. They said, in dusty little towns around the country, that witches could turn into balls of fire and fly through the air. That's how they explained Will-o'-the-Wisps. And she thought of that and of the dream she'd had about a golden woman. Will of the West! Will of the West! Like, like yes! Ori! <laughs> yes! That's cool. um, it's amazing. I do want to say, I, along with playing, I go through waves of like wanting to read, wanting to play, watching all the time. And I went through a little lull. I had started it and I read a good chunk and then I just like put it on hold and I was like, maybe I'll just, I'll read half of it. Um, and I ended up reading 200 pages yesterday. Whoa. Um, it's 300 pages. Because I thought I was just going to read like half. And part you of me. In the zone. That's how you get in the zone when you start and you're just like done. Yeah, well, it, it was a trek only because that is the most I've read in one sitting maybe my entire life. But one, I did, I hit the, the halfway point and I was like, okay, I can keep going and then we'll just see what happens. So then I did. And then I was like, oh, this is a lot. And I was like, well, let me just read a little bit more. And then I got sad because then I thought, well, crap, if I finish it, then then it'll be done. I had the Crimson Peak soundtrack playing and I was reading it. And then there were some moments that were like, <gasps> because stuff happens. Um, and yeah, I mean, by the end of it, I was very exhausted. I got in the zone a few times, but the zone was like 30 pages. But I'm very proud of myself for sitting and finishing it. And now um, I am bummed that it's over. But I am excited. This will be made into a show, I believe, Ooh. or a movie. I want to say it's a show. Do you and know? I'm do you so know who's excited. making it, or when, or anything about it? No idea. No idea. No. Um, no, no. Uh, I think it was just early talks because that's how I saw people talking about it. And then I saw the cover, and I was like, I want that. I want to frame this. It's beautiful. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's very horror gothicy. And it turns out I freaking love that stuff. But if you don't like being scared while reading, then I don't recommend it at all. But if you like romance, I think maybe you could overlook the horror. So is it like Stephen King scary horror? 
Like, is it like Pet Cemetery horror or is it like murder mystery horror? Yeah, it's so there's suspense. It's not like ah, stabby stabby all the time. Um, but it's it reminds me of Haunting of Hill House, but take it down a few notches in the horror aspect. Okay. Maybe just take it down like two, maybe three. Okay. Um, because it's very much like the house has the house is a character and within the house there's so many different people and she has dinner and knowing me is just so cool and she comes in there she's just like this ball of like colorful vibes and energy and everyone around her is just like completely different and so she's trying uh. to figure out her way in that space while trying to figure out what's wrong with her cousin they say it's tuberculosis but it's oh. not it's a lot. Oh, I love it's how great. into it you are. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, and Disco in the comments was saying, like, what do you suggest to do for someone who's not really a big reader? Is Audible, like, something to do? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I have really gotten into it because I multitask and someone is doing all the reading for you and you just have to listen. So I guess that is easier. And if you like nonfiction, it's still really great for car rides and things like mm -hmm. that. It's probably a good entry point. Yeah. Yeah. Audible is great for multitaskers. Agreed. Highly recommend. I used it for working out so that I don't have to worry about like dropping the book or my head bobbing up and down if I'm on the elliptical. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or Audible if I uh, need to just rock a pool floaty for a little bit so I don't have to worry about getting a book wet. Like there's so many yeah. things that I feel like Audible is. And of course, LA traffic is what we're And I love them for. both. Like I've got books and I've got Audible. Like it's, it's as long as we're listening and consuming and getting through them, I think it's a win. It's a win. It's um, a win. I, I would also <laughs> recommend just if you want to sit down and read it. It's a win. Wow. Oh my god! Wow. <laughs> I fear. Um, I would also recommend like if you want to sit down and read to do like fifteen pages at a time. Just start out small because for me, I can't do Audible. Because I just like my mind just wanders. So I much yeah. rather one read out loud. I did that for part of this, but also um, read with music that is very much in the spirit of what you're reading. It locks you into the zone. Yeah. Yeah. So That's it's like almost does on Nerdist. He has but, to listen to the accompanying music. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like reading a script. I think of it like that. And then I'm like, it's like watching a movie. So you, he's an ENFJ as well. Who and when Hector, he's reading the book, is. Yes, and he he imagines when he's reading the book what the scene looks like, and he's the director. <gasps> you too? Wow. I have different yeah. mediums come in where it's like a water painting or like, hi, love. Oh. It's time. Um, yeah, no, it's so interesting how my brain works through it all. A lot of video game characters and like uh, influences. Yeah. Hmm, anyway. So I love fascinating. it. I love it. So that about wraps up reading. I will let you know I got my test results uh, for as much as anybody cares. Uh, yeah, yeah. I do. My personality type, according to 16personalities.com, uh, is ENTJ. ENTJ. Yeah, not the S because that's you are the creative side of that. So ENTJ. Yeah, that makes sense because I'm ENFP. So we've got mm -hmm. the ENs down, mm -hmm. but the other half, the other part, we are very opposite. Uh, my sister um, went to school and studied a, a ton of psychology throughout undergrad and grad school. And I remember her telling me once, you are as J as J as people can get. And I was like, okay. And so that's how I always remember that I'm J. Yeah. So the difference, we can talk about the differences in power down of ours, but I, I think it's really fascinating. And this is all I've been doing for like the last week. Uh, so Ridian like, M is 100% oh, PB and J. Dante Bogdan is LMAO. Uh, so uh -huh. thank you, everybody, so much for sharing. Um, so that wraps up our power. However, we do have a bums away Q&A. So um, this means that Amy, the lovely Amy Cassandra Martinez, will source questions from Twitch chat and from Geek Bombs Patreon and Discord to ask, and then we will do our best to answer them. Q&A. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just like I love you so much, and I'm using you. But you're so this. This first one is from True Scorn. What is a TV or movie character or role you think you could play or would fit you? Oh, the best friend that convinces the, the 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 main protagonist to just put the ice cream down and dump his ass. That's I think if we were to be, ever be like cliched cast, 
So not necessarily like an actual character, but like a trope. That a would trope. be my trope. Yeah, yeah, it says TV or movies character or role you think you could play or would fit you. Um. Oh, Satine in uh, Star Wars, the Duchess Satine, who has a relationship with Obi Wan Kenobi, and she's basically like the Duchess of Mandalore. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I had I had an acting teacher once tell me that my energy and persona is very similar to the roles that Laura Linney plays. Oh, interesting. And that I would you? that I could be cast as Laura Linney's type characters. Um, yeah. I see. So I guess maybe that, I yeah, I don't know. I never, when I was doing the traditional acting in Hollywood thing, I never really figured out what my type was um, because I'm short and curvy. That's oh, such yeah, a girl. So that's who I want to play if they ever do it in real life. Nice. But I completely agree with you being Laura Linney because she's super likable, personable, but can get flustered if like things aren't sort of done in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that's why, I think that's why they were like, oh yeah, the stories, the type of stories that Laura Linney tells, you would be really great to tell those same type of stories. Um, but I'm like the dynamic Kirk in Girls, where it's just like, who cares? Um, you want to do Are you looking out for you, girl? Uh. Mm -hmm. Amy, what about you? Um, for me, I, uh, one of the classes that I took was Sitcom 101. And one of the first things that we had to do was stand in front of the class and they basically put us into a tie. And the very first thing that I got was student body president. Um, so you're the reason I find funny. So, yes, election. I was just going to say, what is that election? Mm -hmm. Election, yeah. I've also gotten um, uh, like someone that is a little, uh, like that looks like totally cool and like norm normal on the outside but like she's sneaky on the inside Ooh. like she's up to something um so as far as characters i don't really know i don't know but um i don't know i don't know i would love to be in a horror movie so hey girl get um, it uh yeah that's yeah, horror movies that's were it. like all i ever got cast in in my early days there are so many bad horror films out there that i have small <laughs> roles in um, some yeah. that I have larger roles in. They're all very bad. Because it was from my the time in my career when I was like, well, maybe if I get one shot that's good for my reel, like, I'm not doing anything else that Saturday. I might as well. Not ever even thinking this could end up on the internet forever. Or, you know, that, like, this could come back to bite me in the butt one day. Or, no, that being said, they're all just really poorly made films. It's not like I did anything in them that I regret people seeing or anything like that. They're just not good films. What roles were you cast in? Oh my goodness. Um, crazy Girlfriend. Uh, in one, I'm the murderous Egyptian goddess that comes back to murder all the teenagers nice yeah and one of them i was like a buffy type character where i was like a demon slayer that was cool again the fight choreo was so bad though that like you can't even watch it oh yes 100 percent. like and then the people are like Hoo! like so so bad so bad they all exist somewhere i keep joking that i was in an episode of entourage once echelon um, yeah, I, I gave it, I gave it a good try before tripping and falling into the internet and hosting, but I gave it I, a good run. I, I never wanted to act. It was on my I always thought it was fun, but I had more fun on stage where you have a little bit more freedom to the type of roles you can play. Whereas when I got out here, I'm short and curvy. So kind of every casting person was like, huh, well, I want to type you as one thing from here down, but I want to type you as another thing from here up, so I'm not really sure what to do with you. Like, I didn't yeah. neatly fit into any cookie-cutter type, so they didn't know I what to do really, with me. I didn't really fit through the door frame, so, yeah, they didn't really know what to do with me either. <gasps> yeah, anyway, I, I, if a dorkable was a type back then, I think I probably would have done a little better, but that was not in fashion. New Girl and Zoe, Zoe Deschanel had not really made their impact on the world at that point yet. You're both a bit of a manic pixie, huh? Is it the brunette thing? Is it the glasses thing? Is it the innocence thing? I didn't have the glasses until, no, for me it was always the thing of like, I'll come in and do my read and 
try to be as like professional and on top of it and if the role calls for like sexy or really like dramatic sadness like do my thing and then walk into the door frame on the way out of the audition room <sighs> like I could just never right never really <laughs> stick the landing like there was always something off about that girl <laughs> So they're actually talking about being Velmas. If if you were in, um, you know, what's it called? The Scooby Scooby-Doo. Gang. Would, would, are you more of the Velma or are you a Daphne? Because I think I'm a Daphne. I think you're a Daphne too. Uh, I'm a Scooby. <laughs> I don't think I'm either one no. of those. Amy! You're a Velma, babe. You're a Velma. I'm not a Velma. How? Velma? Velma? Yeah. The one that is the brains behind the squad and no one gets, they don't do anything until she figures it out. Well, I don't know about the brains, but I'll certainly like light a fire under people's butts. Doc Lazarus in chat says, Amy just wants those snacks. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. <laughs> not wrong at all. Not wrong. Right. Do, we have any, do we have any other questions in there? We do. Um, Ollie Morrison, if you were a character in a fighting game, what would your special move be? I talk about this a lot. I think I've already done this. My Mortal Kombat finishing move. Mm -hmm. I, I rip their spine out from their neck and I use it to whip their face or something. Ooh. Spinal fluid. Why well, I shouldn't do that on camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll obviously <laughs> have to <laughs> work in progress. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh -huh. The things you learn when you've been on camera for a bit on the internet. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, oh, so if I could like, just do like a super cool move, I don't know, I would say it would have to be something like from Injustice 2 where you like slam people through one scene into another scene all the way up into space, all the way back down, like something super cool like that. But yeah, I mean, I would want my special move to be something like that. Although I feel like it would also be funny to do like real life special moves. Like I feel like my real life finisher would be some kind of your grounded fatality. Oh my God, just bring that mom energy hard. Have you eaten enough today? Discipline. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amy? Uh, I think mine would be the Hulk. Um, he has this move in Marvel's Avengers where he grabs one person. And sometimes like, he'll grab something from the ground and throw it at someone. But sometimes he'll just like grab a person, just like shake him. And it looks like a little toy and he like, throws them on the ground. Oh, That's yeah, pretty like fun. That. That's very cute. Um, RVC's, uh, RCV, sorry, uh, Trisha says the no, no finisher. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be, that's a hundred percent the like your grounded mom mm. discipline finisher. The no, no, mm. Mm -mm, not standing for that nonsense. Take your business Shame. elsewhere. It's I not hand very scary. It, 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 get. <laughs> it's not very scary. Do we have any from Twitch, Amy? Um, what do you think STS2884 asks, what do you think about Microsoft buying Bethesda? Ooh, I have so many thoughts about this. But the TLDR of mine is that I my knee-jerk reaction as someone who primarily plays games on my PC was this is very exciting because now Bethesda games will be on Game Pass and Game Pass Ultimate on launch day on day one and for a lot of people going through this pandemic who cannot afford $70 a title for brand new games it's really exciting that they will have access to these games through a game pass subscription which is a fairly low monthly price of $10 a month or $15 a month depending which one you get um, so to me that was happy news also now that Obsidian and Bethesda are under the same umbrella maybe a new Fallout New Vegas so in general for me I was like Ooh, this is interesting news. However, I completely understand the other side of that coin where people are like, is Microsoft getting too powerful now? Are they a monopoly? Um, mm -hmm. Or are people on PlayStation no longer going to be able to play Bethesda games? Which Microsoft has said they will decide on a case-by-case -case basis and the PS5 exclusives that have already been announced, they will honor those exclusives. I feel like we, we do more damage when we start doing exclusive titles and because like the solution for that just becomes you have to spend all your money on everything. Um, I like uh, the fact that this, I don't know, it's, a, it's, it's interesting in the way where it's like, I don't think Xbox is becoming necessarily too powerful because PlayStation has outsold pretty much on every single console thus far. Um, and I think they're set to do it again with the PS5. 
So it's like, I'm not worried about PlayStation in this regard. I think this is a huge win for Bethesda being a third party studio that's like now kind of like aligned with a brand. But I think that as if the difference is PlayStation jacking it up to 70 bucks a pop and um, Xbox is just saying a monthly subscription where you can get all these titles like from day one. I think that this, if anything, is changing the way that we are buying and consuming video games. I mean, long gone are the days of discs uh, because we've got digital only titles, but now just having like, it's like a Netflix kind of thing where it's like, here is your slate, this is the library and you have access to anything in it for a monthly um, amount, which is so different to what we usually do, which is pick and choose what you want to play because it's an investment and you hope you like it and it's not Persona fucking five. Well, and of course, there are people who prefer physical media, whether it comes to their movies or their games, and still will want to pay that that large sum of money just to have the physical media, um, because having a subscription service, what if it gets taken off Game Pass and then you can't play it anymore, you know, or what if something goes off Netflix that you love, et cetera, et cetera. So that presents its own can of worms issues. So I understand wanting to have the physical media too. Um, I just, yeah, I think that Microsoft is not playing the, we're trying to outsell the next gen console. They kind of don't care. Microsoft is playing the, just come into our ecosystem game. That's exactly it. PlayStation is going to make their money from the hardware and Xbox is going to make its money from the software. And at the end of the day, we're all users. Dun, 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 bringing it all back around. I would like to think of us as players in the gaming space. Oh, we're getting played. Yeah. All the world's a stage. This is a cynicism that we talk about. Yeah. I am being cynical. <laughs> but that's okay, Ma. That's who you are. <laughs> You're like this bright beacon of optimism. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but... Mm. <laughs> Far out. How do we even get along? We're so different. <laughs> Not terribly different. Only one letter off in your personality quiz, right? Oh, two letters off. And I'm like, that's half a glass, half an empty glass. And you're like, it's half full. <laughs> anyway, we digress. We have a Power Down show, which we record after this, that is only available for Patreon backers at the $10 and higher amount. We usually have a lot of catch-ups, conversations. We steer a little bit more clear of the PWR side of things and talk about us and what's going on and really cool things like that. Uh, we take sometimes questions that you guys submit on Patreon as well into that. Uh, there's one last question, though, that the Grand Pigeon has just swooped in with. Cake or pizza? Cake or pizza? <gasps> pizza. Why not both? Pizza. Yeah. Why not both? Uh-huh. No, what do you think? No cake, cake at all? I don't like cake. What did cake ever do to you? <laughs> it was too sweet. It was, it was too, sweet. too sweet. Oh, man. That's okay. Yeah, pizza. Controversial. Very hey, controversial. I'm like, can I have yeah. both tonight? Pizza followed oh. by cake when I'm done my pizza. Right? Yes. Good times. Yes. All right. Thank you guys all so much for the questions. Thank you, everybody, so very much. Thank you, of course, Maud. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for joining us and making this show possible every week. This is so much fun always to pick everybody's brain and just talk about what we're playing, watching, and reading. Um, I do want to take a moment to shout out the folks who – went ahead and followed or subscribed or gifted subs during the show today since we don't have our normal notifications turned on. I do want to say a huge thank you to, let's see what we got. It is now, okay. Classy Librarian rated with a party of nine. STS 2884 Yay. resub for 14 months. Happy subversary to you. The Dat Network with a raid at the beginning of the stream with a party of 69 people. Thank you so much, the Dat Network. That's the Dragons and Things Network. If any of you saw um, the sci-fi RPG that I guessed it on a bit, that was their network, and they do awesome stuff over there, so go give them a follow. Um, Super Nintendo Caribou, thank you for the resub. And Zraken75, thank you so much for gifting five subs on the channel. Welcome to all the new Dragon Riders. Alienware2020, thank you for gifting a sub. You are awesome sauce. And Classy Librarian, thank you for the bits. Welcome to everybody else who followed during the last hour and a half of the show. Welcome to the Dragon Riders. So happy to have you here. And I should mention that not only is the Dragon Rider Discord open to everybody, but so is the Geek Bomb Discord as well. If you use Command, I think it's Command Geek Bomb in chat, it will give you all the places to follow Geek Bomb as well, since today's show is a collaboration between the Dragon Rider community and the Geek Bombers. Yay. Yeah. Uh, also, Amy, where is your uh, horror podcast happening and when? 
It's a show. It's a show that I do live every Saturday at 2 p.m. Pacific time on Twitch. I just like stream to Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook as well. Um, just go ahead and follow me on YouTube. Or if you're already here, twitch.tv slash Cassandra MTZ. It rhymes. Yay. All right. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Bye, guys.